pleasure to be with you this morning. Cindy and I were here last Sunday to uh, begin the celebration of our 40th wedding anniversary. Last Sunday was uh, our Sunday. All those uh, congratulations go to Cindy for coming out with me in these uh, 40 years, really 42 years if you count the time that we were growing out together. This morning, I want to share with you a message that I've entitled Sailing the storms. I know that there are at least four kinds of people here this morning. There are those who have been through a stormy time in their lives. There are those who are going through a stormy time in their lives. There are those who will be going through a stormy time in your lives. And there are those of you who know someone who is right now going through a very stormy time in their lives. The storms of life can be like the real weather storms, like uh, Tropical Storm Isaac. I'm not sure if uh, Isaac is a hurricane yet or not, but uh, bearing down on Florida, just like hurricanes and tornadoes, earthquakes, and uh, all kinds of weather type storms, the storms of life that we deal with in our homes, at work, and school, can be very similar. They can hit hard and they can hit unexpected. They can do major damage, they can do a little bit of damage, and sometimes no damage at all. Storms can leave you feeling battered or they can make you realize what you have and appreciate what you have. They can also leave you with memories. Some of those memories will be good, and some of those memories Bad. I know people who are facing storms in their lives. I know people who have relationships that are crumbling and there's increased hostility within their homes and in their family life. I know people who have bills that are piling up and this tends to lead to stress and anger levels intensify as well in their homes and families. I know people who live in a home, who live in a family that they expected to be a safe place, a secure place for them, and it's anything but. And I know people who are asking the question, where is Jesus in the middle of my story? Where is Jesus in these turbulent waters? The passage of scripture this morning is Mark chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, turn to it, read along, make sure I'm reading the right uh, scripture, but it's also on the screen. And if you can see it, I know I can see it from back here, but if you can see it, I'd like for us to read it aloud together. So would you, if you're able, would you please stand with me as we read together God's word from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, in our 
lives. The first lesson that I believe we can learn from this particular story, the, exa the uh, uh, example of the disciples and Jesus, is that Jesus led them into the storm. Did you notice that? It was Jesus who said in verse 35, let us go over to the other side. It was his idea to get in the boat. It was his idea to leave where they were at that time and, and to cross the Sea of Galilee and go to the other side. One of the things that I've learned in my life is that we can bring storms on ourselves through disobedience. We can bring storms on ourselves through poor decisions that we make, poor planning, all kinds of things. However, not every storm we face is because we did something wrong. Not every storm that we go through is because of sin or disobedience in our lives. I believe that we often end up in storms because we obey Jesus, because we follow His Word, because we go where He leads us to go. And that's the case with the disciples that night. They end up in a storm because Jesus said, let's go to the other side. Jesus leads his followers, leads his disciples right into the storm. These men had followed Jesus' bidding. They had done what he had told them to do. Yet here they are. They faced one of the most terrifying events in their lives up to this point. You remember the story of Jonah. He went into a storm, but that's because of disobedience. The disciples here are going into this storm because they obeyed Jesus. They did what he told them to do. The point here, they are there because of Jesus. No storm surprises our Lord. No storm unnerves him. This particular point, I think, gets at the root and core of what we believe about Jesus. It gets to the core issue of faith. Jesus made a promise to his disciples when he said, let's go to the other side. He didn't say, let's perish in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Do you think they would have obeyed him then? He didn't say that. He made a promise to them when he said, let's go to the other side. He knew. I mean, just think about it. Do you, do you think Jesus had no knowledge that this all the storm was going to come up when he said, let's go to the other side. Do you really believe that Jesus had no idea what he was leading the disciples into? He promised his disciples that they would cross over to the other side. Now, I think somewhere in the middle of that storm, they forgot that he said, let's go to the other side. How true it is with many of us when we're going through a storm, we've forgotten the promises of God. We've forgotten the promises that have been made to us. And a lot of times we've forgotten how He has brought us through storms in the past. He promised His disciples that they would cross to the other side. You may be going through a stormy time in your life at this particular point. Have you ever thought that maybe Jesus is leading you into the storm and has led you into for a particular reason. The second thing I learned from this passage of Scripture is that the boat will not sink with Jesus in it. The boat will not sink with Jesus in it. Jesus was with them. They wouldn't die because it was not time for Jesus to die. Of course, they didn't know that. Here's Jesus sleeping peacefully, he was not afraid of the storm. He's in the back of the boat. He's on a cushion. He has the best seat on the boat. And there he is at peace. He's resting. He's not afraid of the storm. They needed the disciples. I know it's very easy to stand here and judge them at this time, but they needed to take their cue from Jesus. He's sleeping in the middle of the storm. What does that mean? We'll get to that in just a few moments. But think of all the worries Jesus could have had. That's a lot that keeps us from sleeping many times in our storms. Think about the worries that might have kept him awake. He could worry about the religious and political leaders who plotted against him actively. He could worry about his family, who, who in a passage of scripture prior to this one, thought he was crazy, thought he 
was demon possessed, pain again, Jesus come home with, you know, you're making a scene here. He could worry about what his family thought about him. They thought he was crazy. He could worry about the overwhelming crowds that he was ministering to and their overwhelming needs. He could worry about the disciples that he chose. He could worry about the future because he knew what was coming in the future. But no, he doesn't do that. Here he is in the middle of the storm, in the back of the boat, asleep with all these things that he could have worried about. Jesus was not worried. He slept like a baby in a rocking boat in the middle of a violent storm. Twenty-two years ago, Cindy was diagnosed with MS. Many of you know this story. We've shared it publicly many times. And uh, several months after she was diagnosed with the MS, which was, uh, you know, like a storm in our life, she'd gone through eight months of illness, sickness, weakness, and all kinds of diagnostic tests that kept coming back negative. We knew what was not wrong with her. We did not know what was wrong with her until uh, December 9th. And she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Several months after that, the summer after that, we were here at the Bay, and I remember vividly sitting down here at Back Bay and watching Cindy gingerly, carefully walk into the water. Now, my wife has been coming up here to this campground from, since she was a baby. Uh, we spent part of our honeymoon here. She introduced me to Alton Bay. Uh, she knew those waters. I've seen her run in prior to that summer. She would run into the water, dive in. I'm the one who would carefully be from North Carolina and not liking this cold Lakeland Wisconsin. I would be the one carefully walking in. But as I walked her, as I watched her walk with some difficulty, I started asking God, where will we be in five years? Where will we be in ten years? And I just kept going out, you know, 20 years, 25 years. Where will we be? It was, I didn't get an answer right away, but eventually, this passage of scripture came to me. From 2 Corinthians 12, 9. For Jesus said to the Apostle Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. What I was being told in the midst of, of a changing life, in the midst of um, dreams that were going to have to be adjusted, as I was dealing with all of that, God came, Jesus came and said, My grace is sufficient. I know what's going to happen in five years, I'll be there. I know what's going to happen in ten years, I'll be there. I know what's going to be to happen in twenty years, I'll be there. That was the message that I was getting. And when you get to that point, my grace is sufficient for you. In my spirit, I was hearing him say, I know what is there, and I will be there with you. A few years ago, and some of you know about this as well, Cindy was in the Lady Clinic in Burlington, Massachusetts, she had uh, developed uh, what they came to call a toxic metabolic reaction in her body. Uh, left her uh, for about 11 days without any memory. She was not conscious of what was happening. She uh, lost her ability to swallow. And one morning, I got a call, uh, emergency call at 4.30 in the morning saying that she was uh, in respiratory distress. They had to put her into the ICU, and she was on the during that period of time, there was a hospital chaplain who came to me at least twice. And in one of those visits, the hospital chaplain said to me, where do you see God in all of this? Now I want you to know, that's a question that I had been struggling with. I was beginning to wonder, God, where are you? It was almost like Jesus is in the back of the boat asleep. I'm here and, you know, Cindy's not coming out of this. In fact, she's getting worse. Jesus, where are you? And, and this chaplain, led by the Holy Spirit, I believe, got me to focus and just said, where do you see God? And I started to look for him. I started to look for him. Rather than thinking that we were all alone in the storm, I was reminded again that 
His grace is sufficient. And I was also reminded of Deuteronomy 31 6. God's word to Joshua as he prepared to lead the Israelites into the promised land. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And then finally, this passage from Hebrews 13 6. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Jesus led them into the storm. The boat will not sink because Jesus is in it. The third lesson I learned from this passage that I think is helpful as we sail through the storms is that fear and faith cannot occupy the same space. Fear and faith cannot occupy the same space. Jesus says to his disciples in verse 40, Why are you so afraid? That's the first question he says. To them. You know, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? No faith means no trust in him on this particular occasion. That's what he's dealing with. They did not yet realize that Jesus was God. He was the one who could control the wind and the waves, everything. In your heart, in my heart, and in our minds, it's either faith or fear. Right? It, it, they cannot occupy the same space. Fear is a natural state for us because some situations, frankly, are scary. We don't know the future. We don't know the bad things that can happen. Some things are way too big for us to handle. And, and fear is a natural state. But when we receive God's gift of faith, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ and, and the Holy Spirit comes and, and into our lives, we receive this gift of faith. And fear says, this situation in my life is too much for me to handle. But faith says, God is in control. He will help me handle this. Fear says, I'm not sure if God is strong enough to handle this. Faith says, nothing is more powerful than God. Fear says, I'm not sure if I can trust God. Faith says, God only wants what's best for me. The disciples are so real. They're just so human. They wake Jesus. They ask him an, an accusing question. Look at verse 38. What do they say to him? It said, verse 38, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care? See that? Don't you care if we drown? It wasn't, Jesus, wake up, we need a little extra help here. There's water coming in, and there's only so many of us. Here, here's, here's a bucket. <laughs> you know, we used to, when you just wake up, come on and help us. We, we need you. No, they don't do that. They, just, they say, don't you care about us? You see how they get emotionally involved there? Isn't that the way we are when we're going through storms? And, and you know, some of you are going through these storms where you just, you got that feeling, Jesus, in the back of the boat. He's asleep. You're waiting for him to step in. You're waiting for him to help you. And you're beginning to wonder, does he care? Does he even care about what I'm going through? Does he even care that I'm about to lose my house? Does he even care that my marriage is falling apart? Does he even care that my children are walking away from him? Does he even care that my, my body, my health is falling apart? Does he even care? In our storms, we can get angry with God. We can get angry with Jesus. I, I, maybe I'm reading too much into what the disciples are saying, but I don't think they had a smile on their faces when they were asking him this question. I don't think they were filled with joy. I think they were put out. <laughs> the idea that Jesus who died for us would not care about our pain or our anxiety or our fear makes no sense when you stop to think about it. It makes no sense because he died for you. He, he died on the cross for each and every one of us. He shed his blood that we would have eternal life. 
that we would not have to pay the penalty for our sin. That sounds like somebody who really cares about us. And if we're going through a particular storm, I don't think he's going to leave us. I think he cares about that. I don't think he stops loving. I don't think he stops caring. But I think the problem with some of us, I'm not going to point fingers. I think the problem with some of us is that we thought when we followed Jesus, when we put our faith in him, and when we started obeying him and doing everything his word tells us to do, we thought his job was to protect us from the storms. Amen? We thought that we're Christians. We're not supposed to go through problems. We're not supposed to have these kinds of issues. I'm a believer. I've obeyed God. I made a few mistakes, but God's supposed to deliver me from those. That's bad theology. It's bad doctrine. I think that's why so many of us respond with anger and resentment when the storms hit. We see Jesus asleep in the back of the boat. He's supposed to have saved us from this. He was supposed to have kept us. He should not have said, let's go to the other side if he knew there was a storm coming. He should have said, hey guys, go this way because there's a squall coming up. And we forget that he's in the boat with us. Fear and faith cannot occupy the same space. Then the last lesson I learned. And that is, don't miss the big picture. Could the story of Jesus possibly end with him drowning in the middle of the Sea of Galilee? Yeah, Jesus, from the very beginning, intended to get to the other side. He knew what was ahead, and he intended to deliver his disciples to the other side, to sail through the story. The great preacher of the 19th century England, Charles Spurgeon, put it well when he asked, and I quote, Was it reasonable for these men to think that he, who could foresee the future, would take them on board a ship when he foreknew that a storm would wreck them? Would so kind a leader have taken them to sea to drown them? Was it reasonable to think that he, who was so favored of God, would be left to perish? Would he have gone to sleep if they had really been in danger? Was it reasonable to believe that the king of Israel was about to be drowned, even if he whom they knew to be the light of the world? Our unbelief, Spurgeon goes on to say, our unbelief, my brethren, seldom deserves to be reasoned with. Our fears are often intensely silly, and when we get over them and ourselves look back upon them, we're full of shame. That we should have been so foolish. Our Lord kindly censured their unbelief because it was unreasonable. Sometimes God calms the storm. Sometimes he lets the storm rage and he calms his child. What is the big picture of your storm? If you're in the middle of one right now, and this is something for you to think about if you've been through a storm or when one comes along. What is the big picture? You see, it is so easy for us to zero in on the waves coming over the bow of the boat or the water that's beginning to creep up our ankles near our knees. Getting, and we become focused on that instead of Jesus who's in the boat. I think that's what the disciples were doing. They were focused on all this water. And I can't blame them. You know, sometimes I get focused on the difficulties. I get focused on the tough times. I get focused on the, the things that I don't like. And it's very difficult sometimes to remember that Jesus is back there. And he said, let's go to the other side. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 8 through 10, talks about a big picture I am for him. Let me read it for you. In fact, I think it's, there it is. It's on the screen. I think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and completely overwhelmed, and we thought we would never live through it. Does that sound like a storm to you? Crushed, completely overwhelmed, thought we would never live through it. 
fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we learned not to rely on ourselves, but on God who can raise the dead. And he did deliver us from mortal danger. And we're confident that he will continue to deliver us. We're overwhelmed, but the big picture that Paul learned from that particular storm in his life, the big picture was God is not left us. The big picture is that we are not to rely on ourselves, but to rely on God. When we're working with couples who are in distress, one of the questions that I will eventually ask them, especially if we get into a log jam, we get to one of those times when we're trying to resolve an issue where it just seems like there's no resolution. It's almost like, you know, I'm over here and, and I'm not budging. Uh, I'm over here, I'm not budging. And, I, and, and there I sit between the two of them and it's like, okay, nobody's budging, so what are we going to do? For, for many years now, when I get to that place with a couple, I will always ask this question. What are you going to do to keep this seemingly unsolvable problem from destroying what's good about your relationship? In other words, what is the big picture? The big picture is you love each other. The big picture is you believe uh, that each of you is a spouse of goodwill. The big picture is you want to save this relationship. The big picture is there are good things you, you've you're not focused on them right now. You can't think about them right now because of this bad storm that you're going through. But what are you going to do about this seemingly unsolvable problem? In other words, what's the big picture? What are you going to do to protect what's good about your relationship? And it's then that I begin to see movement and change. I think that's something for each and every one of us to think through when we're in the midst of our storm. What is the big picture? My spouse is saying things to me I don't like. My spouse is doing stuff I don't like. Things are going on in my school that I don't like. They're doing stuff at the workplace, you know, relationships and relationships are struggling. And the key is in the middle of the storm, if it's finances, if it's relationships, whatever, if it's your health, whatever it is, what is the big picture? And as we look at this storm that the disciples and Jesus are in, in the, midst, in the middle of the sea, what is the big picture? For me, I believe the big picture is that Jesus is in both. Jesus is there. And the storm will not last forever. Jesus was there with the disciples in the middle of this storm that came up suddenly. He's also present with you and with me in the midst of our storms today. And if you're not in the story time, God bless you, praise God, but you're going to have story times in coming soon. Well, not soon. I can't, I'm not a prophet, uh, so I can't say soon, but you're going to have some story times. And so here are four things I want you to remember. Let's put them up on the screen. Jesus led them into a storm. You may be going into a stormy time. You may be in a stormy time because Jesus has led you into it. It's not because of anything you've done wrong, but it's because Jesus has said, let's go to the other side. It's because you're obeying him. You're following him. You're doing what he has called you to do. And then remember that the boat will not sink because Jesus is in it. Now, if Jesus is not in your boat, that's what you need to deal with this morning. If, he, if he's not in your life, if he is not your Savior, if he's not your Lord, that's what you need to deal with in the middle of your storm right now. He needs to get in the boat. He doesn't need to be out there on the sea walking on the water. I mean, he can do that, and that's a good place. But quite frankly, I want him in my boat, and that's where you need to get him. And you do that by putting your faith in him. You, you believe with your whole heart that, that he is your Savior, and you give him control of your life. You make him Lord. You decide, I'm not going to control my life anymore. I'm not going to make all these fast decisions without consulting Jesus first. That's where you begin. 
Thirdly, fear and faith cannot occupy the same space. And so I, I spoke with uh, I spoke with a, a woman last uh, not last Sunday, two weeks ago, whose husband was going in for brain surgery, and uh, she came to me at the end of the service and just said to me, uh, "I'm fearful, I'm scared, and I don't want to be. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I don't want to be. I, I don't want to be scared." And I said, "It's all right to be scared." It's all right to admit that you have fear. The key is, what do you do with your faith? Do you let fear rule you or faith? Because they cannot occupy the same space. Fourthly, don't miss the big picture. Don't miss what God is wanting to do in your life. 22 years ago when Cindy was diagnosed with that MS and the stories that we've gone through as a result of it, uh, so many stories. So one of the things we talked about this past uh, June, we, we spent some time talking about what is the big picture, and we've been we've been seeing God's big picture. He hasn't healed her. He hasn't brought us out of some of these squalls that come up, but He has promised that He would never leave us, He would never never forsake us, and He's helping us see the big picture of what he wants to do in each of our lives and how he wants to use us for his kingdom. I think God wants to do that in the middle of your storm. And he wants you to be reminded of that. Stay focused on the big picture. And don't become overwhelmed by the water crashing over the waves of the world. Let's go.